So, together Ambassador. again. <laughs> together again, that's right. Um, I want to start by asking you a, a real general comment. One of the interesting things that you noted a long time ago was that the struggle that we face uh, with radical Islamists, uh, and Islam is a religion, Islamism is an ideology. One of the things you noted a long time ago is this is going to be a long struggle. It's not going to be something that's going to disappear overnight. And I, I'd like you just to sort of offer your perspective on the nature of the challenge, how we ought to think about it, why it's not simply going to disappear quickly. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Congressman, if you're still in the House for a very, a very kind introduction. I was delighted to save your bacon <laughs> by, by, by praising your two-star boss <laughs> for what he would not have approved having you do. Um, we weren't there to lose gracefully, as you recall, and um, it was take no prisoner's time, metaphorically speaking, of course. Um, thanks to the Hudson Institute uh, for the invitation to be here. Thanks uh, in particular for uh, arranging for me to be, have the privilege of being on the stage again with uh, one of America's great diplomats and certainly the dean of those uh, who have wrestled with the problems uh, of the Middle East, uh, Dennis Ross. Uh, I have enormous respect for the Hudson Institute. Uh, done a lot of events with them over the years, and I'm very pleased to be able to be here uh, for this one. Uh, I am a bit disappointed, I must say, uh, that the pink ladies were ushered out of the house earlier today. Um, we had a very close relationship during the time that I was privileged to command the surge. Uh, never was there an appearance on Capitol Hill that was not um, uh, helped by their greeting to me, uh, usually directly behind me with the cameras uh, getting them in the frame. Uh, and it would have been a sign of continued relevance if they were still in the room. And so I hold, I hold Leon Panetta personally accountable uh, for having them expend all of their energy on him and not saving some for me. Um, this is a great question that you ask, as usual, uh, Dennis, up front, about the duration of the challenge that we face, which, as you know, and we've done this just as little as two weeks ago and love doing it together, uh, I've characterized that as a generational struggle. This is not the fight of a decade, much less a few years. And, um, and maybe, if I could, uh, I'd like to offer five lessons up front that I think that we should learn from the fight uh, against Islamist extremists, and to some degree, by the way, against malign Iranian activity. Um, five of them. The first is that extremists, Islamist extremists, and in some cases in the Shia parts of the world, uh, malign Iranian uh, elements will exploit ungoverned spaces. Uh, it's not a question of if, it's merely a question of when and how significant will that exploitation be? The second is that we have to take action in such situations. Uh, and that's because Las Vegas rules, unfortunately, do not apply in these areas. What happens there does not stay there. They tend to spew violence, instability, extremism, uh, and in many cases, a tsunami of refugees, not just into neighboring countries and throughout the region, uh, but all the way into the Schengen zone and the countries of our NATO allies uh, and partners, as we saw most significantly with the case of uh, the geopolitical Chernobyl, the meltdown of a country that is Syria, and the consequences of that in Europe being very significant domestic populist pressures uh, that we've seen manifest themselves in a variety of different ways in a variety of different elections and referendum, Brexit arguably being among those. So this is not a problem that we can deal with the way that Washington sometimes deals with it, and that is to admire it until it goes away. Unfortunately, it is not going away. The third is that in taking action, the U.S. invariably has to lead. Now, there may be some cases, such as the admirable case of France uh, leading the way in Mali uh, very courageously and skillfully. But in most significant cases, the U.S. will have to lead. And the reason is quite simple, that we have the assets that are proving to be the most valuable of all as we engage in what might be termed 
uh, advise, assist, and enabling operations. And that's what we are doing. This is a big deal, as Joe Biden might have observed. Um, this is a, such a big deal that it is arguably revolutionary, that we are able to defeat the Islamic State in Iraq and in Syria without our young men and women having to be on the front lines more than in select counter-terrorist operations and as advisors. And it's because of the skill of our young men and women, women in uniform and those of coalition countries, and this should be a coalition, and the coalition should include uh, Islamic countries, and I'll explain that more in a moment. But the assets that we can bring to bear, particularly the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance platforms, especially the predators and reapers, uh, the unblinking eye up there seven days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, and the advantage that that provides to the forces that we are advising, assisting, and enabling is profound. You could take all of the similar capabilities of other countries around the world and multiply it times five or six, and I think you probably wouldn't get to the number of orbits that we can keep up there. Now, I'm not talking about little drones. I'm not talking about do-it-yourself quadcopters. I'm talking about the coin of the realm, which is the predators and reapers, which have such extraordinary uh, optics and other intelligence gathering capabilities and from which we can shoot uh, something that very few other countries will do off their platforms that are similar. Beyond that, we have the ability, the unique ability to, to do industrial strength intelligence fusion. This is perfected really, or first done during the surge in Iraq when we brought all of our, uh, we had to build a cloud in Baghdad. We couldn't ship all the data back to the states for uh, intelligence analysis because of the size of it. So we built our own cloud. We brought the applications engineers and, and scientists out from uh, the United States out there. By the way, it's amazing how productive people can be when there's nothing to do but work 24 hours a day. There's nobody asking when they're going to come home for dinner and they can't drink. Uh, pro productivity was extraordinary. But so we have that unique ability as well. And then, of course, the precision strike which many of our allies and partners can also bring to bear, but which we have uh, in industrial strength numbers. So those capabilities are extraordinary, but it should be a coalition. I am a huge believer uh, in having as large a coalition as you can have. I was willing, as the commander of the largest coalition at that time in Afghanistan, to spend whatever it took in coalition maintenance activities, and it should include Muslim countries. If you think about this endeavor right now, this is more this challenge is more of a fight for the heart of the Muslim world. So it's a clash within a civilization more than it is a clash of civilizations to harken back to Sam Huntington's book uh, of that name. And many of our successes uh, in this particular fight have come together with uh, Muslim partners and leaders uh, in intelligence officers and special operators of Muslim countries. The fourth is that in leading, we have to ensure that we in embark on a comprehensive campaign. This has to be what the congressman was referring to earlier. Uh, it's a civil military campaign. Uh, it is not just a counter-terrorist uh, endeavor. In fact, the paradox of this enemy is that you cannot counter terrorists like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda with just counter-terrorist force operations. You are not going to drone strike or Delta Force raid your way out of this problem. It takes all of the above. And in fact, we created a slide for Congress during the surge called the Anaconda Strategy slide just to show that while military force was necessary, absolutely necessary, because without the security foundation, nothing else is possible, it is not sufficient. It takes all the other elements that, again, the congressman was referring to, and he's correct to say that the surge that mattered most was not the surge of forces. It was the surge of ideas. It was a change in strategy, the major elements of which were 180 degrees different over what we were doing before. Instead of consolidating on big bases, you live with the population. Uh, instead of handing off to the Iraqis at an ever-increasing pace, we stopped it and actually took back control until we could reconstitute them promote reconciliation uh, with the Sunni Arab community, by the way, also with the Shia uh, Arab community as well. Uh, stop releasing detainees until you have a rehabilitation program, et cetera, et cetera, all very, very different. 
So this has to be a comprehensive approach with a large coalition that includes Muslim countries. And then finally, the fifth point, which is really what you got me started down this uh, road on in the first place, Dennis, uh, is that this is a generational struggle. Therefore, we must have a sustainable, sustained commitment as our strategy. And what is hugely important is that what was begun by the previous administration, give them credit for that, however reluctant uh, there may have been to return to Iraq and to, to take action in Syria, did get us down this road on which this administration has built now uh, very effectively. Uh, and that is to have a strategy that is sustainable in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure so that we can have the kind of sustained commitment that is necessary in an endeavor that is generational uh, in nature. And so, for example, in Afghanistan, to go to a, an approach that does not have time-phased or time-based drawdowns, regardless of what conditions are on the ground and so forth, uh, is, is a very wise approach. So th thanks for giving me the excuse to deploy the five lessons that we should have learned. Um, anytime you want to travel around the country and make those five points, I will be your sidekick on this. I'm happy to ask the question and trigger the discussion. And I mean in all seriousness, I want to do that because what you just laid out was a conceptual approach to what we're facing. It, it helps to get the big ideas right. Well, it's, you know, basically, if you don't get the big ideas right, you're not going to get the smaller ones. Exactly. They're not going to be right. very relevant. Yep. And I want to I follow up on some of what, sure. what you okay. raised. Look, one of the points you made was if there are ungovernable spaces, those are going to be exploited. Another way of saying that is nature abhors a vacuum. Yep. And in the Middle East, whenever there are vacuums, the worst possible forces fill it. Yep. It's and not just the Middle East, North Africa, Absolutely. Central Asia. Absolutely. So one of the things, one of the principles that I think that has to guide American policy is be very mindful of making sure vacuums don't begin to emerge. Wherever possible. Couldn't agree with you more. So, Which is why we need diplomats, frankly. It's why we need to fill the vacancies in the State Department and so forth. That's part of your comprehensive approach exactly. as well. because. It can't be only military. It's going to have to have an economic dimension, a diplomatic dimension. It's going to have to have an ideological dimension. Sure. No, it's all of the above. And it's, uh, you know, when, when we went back for the surge, I remember the president called me in uh, once I'd been confirmed. And this is the final sort of, you know, pat on the back and photo op before you go off and try to turn big ideas into reality on the ground. And I remember he said something along the lines, well, General, you know, we're doubling down here. And I said, Mr. President, your military is going all in, and we need all the rest of government to go all in with us. And he very much worked to make that a reality. Part of what you also raised was this is not a conflict between civilizations. It's one within a civilization yes. and a culture. Yep. For us to succeed, part of this comprehensive strategy has to be not just having Muslim partners, but having Muslim partners who will discredit the ideology, because we can't. Correct. It is not up to us to discredit this ideology. It has to come from Muslims. Now, Far more authentic. And Absolutely. so that's why the Emirati uh, initiative to counter violent extremism uh, in, uh, in cyberspace, you know, to work to chip away at the virtual caliphate. Because, you know, my worry is that we will take away, we now meaning the forces we're supporting in Iraq and in Syria with a coalition, uh, will defeat the Islamic State on the ground, take away the ground caliphate, one of the true distinguishing right. features of the Islamic State over al-Qaeda, the other being their facility uh, in, in cyberspace, their ability to operate in that new battlefield domain. But an obvious concern is that we can put a stake through the heart of the ISIS army, maybe even through Baghdadi eventually at some point, their leader, but we're not going to be able to put a stake through the heart of the virtual caliphate. Uh, the internet is still going to be active. I think there needs to be much more done by internet service providers and social media platforms. Uh, they've got to do this with artificial intelligence because it's beyond the ability of, of, of human beings to take the action and the, at the frequency and the amount that is necessary. This was done uh, quite effectively uh, in dealing with child pornography. Some of that's illegal. Maybe it's time for legislation to work with those uh, who control these media platforms to take that kind of action. You know, one of the things I would like to see, 
you look at the, uh, the ISIS ideology, and one of the claims is not just that they created a caliphate, which is now being undone, but also that their warriors are basically uh, ones with a divine mandate. Yes. Now, one of the things that we could be doing, apropos of your point on social media, we have now had a significant number of ISIS fighters surrender. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you be both someone who has a divine mandate on the one hand and be surrendering with your hands up on the other? If you want to do a lot to discredit yep. the ideology, nothing yep. does it more than A, showing that, but B, then also having some of them come on and tell their stories. Yep. We'll bring the congressman back on active duty. He had a particular facility for uh, doing this. In truth, the, the, we had a whole series of big ideas that guided uh, our actions in Iraq. You heard a few of them, but they went even further. So we had a communications big idea, and it was be first with the truth. We wanted to try to beat the bad guys to the headline. By the way, the bad guys say the Shia militias in Sadr City had CNN's Baghdad Bureau speed dialed on their cell phone. And as we are doing the extraction of uh, special mission unit JSOC forces from an operation in there. They're already dialing in saying that we've just been responsible for a new atrocity. We're beating them to the headline uh, and pulling in full motion video to show demonstrably that it's they that shot at us, not us at them, right. and this kind of thing. Um, but being able to show that, you know, we've had, we've talked before about the urgency of this, all the way back when we did this, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago, um, we talked about the imperative of accelerating the fight against the Islamic State because the sooner you can show that they're losers right. as opposed to winners right. is the sooner they're no longer as effective in cyberspace, in that new battlefield domain, uh, and the sooner the virtual caliphate doesn't have the same attraction that it used to have. So that's another, by the way, we also have taken away from there the big media center that they had in Raqqa. Uh, there have been great public accounts of how uh, what they had in there, all the screens and everything else that they were using. Very sophisticated operation. So exactly right. Showing this, but again, not, not overdoing it, merely showing the facts. Uh, again, trying to be first with the truth, not with spin. Uh, and by the way, sometimes being first with the facts means that you acknowledge that we made a horrible mistake. Uh, as happened at some days, or that we just had a really bad day. Right. In fact, one of the predecessors of the strategic communications world in which the congressman operated uh, was allowed to return a little before he would have otherwise because there was a difficulty coming out and saying, we had a horrible day today in Baghdad. 150 innocent Iraqis were killed in two different suicide bombings in marketplaces. Here's the facts as we best understand them. Here's the lessons we're taking. Here's what we're going to do with our Iraqi security force partners to mitigate the chances of that happening again. But that's what you've got to do uh, as well. As you know, you can't put lipstick on a pig. Uh, it still is ugly, and all you've done is erode your credibility. So let me, I want to pick up, because you made a reference to the Sadr forces and how you affected them. Today, it's interesting that Sadr may be uh, demonstrating more than anything else that he's an Iraqi nationalist. Very much so. He's the hope in many respects. Right. He's the counterbalance in the Shia political spectrum to these Hashdashabi, the Shia militias that are largely funded, trained, equipped, supported, and even directed to a considerable degree by the Quds uh, by the Quds Force uh, right. of Iraq and by Qasem Soleimani personally. Right. I want, so I want to get at this notion of radical Islamists who are Sunni and Shia. It's not just one or the other. They may right. fight each other. Uh, but the fact is, they have many similar uh, instincts, attitudes, approaches. What binds them is no respect for borders. What binds them is a complete rejection of the other. What binds them is basically an instinct towards dominance and intolerance. Uh, and we can talk about ISIS, we can talk about Al-Qaeda, we can talk about the Muslim, brood, the Muslim Brotherhood, we can talk about the Islamic Republic of Iran, we can talk about uh, Hezbollah, we can talk about many of the popular Hamas. mobilization forces, right? So when you look at this array, they don't all represent the same kind of challenge. When you think about the different challenges they, that they embody or represent, does it call for a more calibrated strategy in your mind? Or do you, do you think that one set of principles works for all? I mean, how do you think about that? Well, I think. In one of the big ideas here is to acknowledge that we never have enough of what we'd like to have. I mean, there's never been a military commander in history who had enough 
soldiers, enough money, enough predators, uh, enough, enough bandwidth nowadays. Right. Um, so you have to, at the end of the day, prioritize. And to some degree, you're going to be allocating shortages. That's what you are doing. Uh, no, no element is going to get everything that they want and, unless you know it's the absolute number one priority. That might be the case. But that means, of course, that the others are not going to get all that they want. So I do think that's exactly right. And you've got to assess in a fairly you know, very cold-eyed way what elements are posing the greatest threat to our homeland uh, and to the homelands of our allies and partners, um, which pose the potential for another 9-11. Uh, again, and I think, again, you've got to do this in a very, very brutally realistic manner noting that you do want to take action against some of the others. I mean, look, in the first year uh, in the surge in Iraq, we decided, I decided, that we had to focus on the uh, Sunni Arab extremists, on al-Qaeda in Iraq, and the associated uh, movements, the, the so-called Sunni insurgent groups, which were threatening the very survival uh, of Iraq as we knew it. And that what we needed to do was do just what was necessary against the Shia militias, uh, which were very damaging as well. Uh, and ideally, we could even get them to take a knee for a while. And that actually happened. It was both serendipity and, you know, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Again, by the way, it was a, largely a result of the communications effort that we had. The Shia militia were responsible in the first probably four months of the surge in Iraq for the assassinations, the deaths, the murder of three governors of Shia provinces in southern Iraq and also three police chiefs of Shia provinces. This is also a very, very big deal. And then they were the catalyst for violence in Karbala, the second holiest city in Shia Islam, during a religious uh, holy uh, period for Shia Islam, something that so outraged uh, the prime minister that he personally strapped on a pistol and went with a column of 100 vehicles from Baghdad down to confront them, was personally arresting people uh, down there. And they realized after we hung the deaths of these six governors and police chiefs and then the violence in Karbala around their neck uh, publicly uh, through, again, f in, again, first with the truth kinds of approaches, that they needed to, to lie low for a while. And that was very, very helpful. Uh, because it reduced quite significantly the violence they were instigating, and it was just at a time when we were starting to drive the violence down against the Sunni insurgents and al-Qaeda uh, in Iraq as well. And that, that, that allowed us to really focus uh, for the entire first year uh, very heavily on the Sunni extremists, uh, and then we would, would turn to the Shia uh, extremist militia forces. We did it a little bit early. Some of you may recall that there was a bit of an impulsive decision by the Prime Minister of Iraq to clean up Basra on a yes. little bit faster timeline than we had right. planned. Uh, and we had to sprint to support that and to move a lot of assets and reposition and so forth and very narrowly averted what was would have been a disastrous defeat, including with him personally down inside Basra City and encircled and instead basically destroyed uh, the Shia militia in the ensuing fighting there, then in Sadr City, then in Qatami and a variety of other Shia locations throughout southern Iraq, having largely, uh, by that point in time, defeated the Sunni extremists as well. You know, one of the interesting uh, elements I might add to your principles is reflecting what you're also now saying. One critical element of this effort is how do you publicly frame what you're doing in a way that is compelling? Yeah. Uh, I want to get into a related issue because the two of us never have a very hard time talking together, and already I realize that we don't have a I was worried time. we weren't going to be able to fill up 45 yeah. minutes. So usually we fill up the stage for quite a bit of time, and we're doing it again. But I want, to, I want to take this concept of framing, and I want to relate it to, if you look at the what I call the imbroglio between the Saudis, Emiratis, Bahrainis, Egyptians versus Qatar right now, in many ways, it distracts from what we need to do in terms of ensuring that they collectively help in filling the vacuum after ISIS, because if very, they don't, very good point. Iran yeah. will. Yeah. And we're already seeing Iran is yep. 
we're talking about this, they're acting about it, it right Iran now. Iran is great about f looking for and finding waves and then riding them. Right, they're doing the point. same thing in northern Iraq right, right. now, obviously, right. where uh, an ill-timed referendum understand the aspirations, absolutely, but a referendum and then it was also conducted in the disputed internal boundary areas right. as well, forced Prime Minister Abadi to have to take action and they were quick to exploit that, as you saw. And now they're pushing beyond what were the, the borders but pre- My understanding is they're stopped, but hope, we'll see. Touch right, we'll wood see. on Especially that, please. Anybody who has wood around them, because we're <laughs> surrounded by plastic up here. Right. Uh, but so, no, I am concerned about that. So yeah. Both to sort of ensure that they help in terms of, of the reconstruction that is necessary, even the governance, the security that is necessary, so that there isn't a vacuum there for the Iranians, but also, uh, to be part of the broader uh, effort to counter what the Iranians are doing with Shia militia more generally in the region, it's important to end this, what is in fact a distraction. I'd like to see it end in a way that the Qataris also are not completely let off the hook. Uh, I've made a suggestion, and I want, I want to get your reactions to it. I made a suggestion that the U.S. should go in and settle this, and the U.S. could do it based on four conditions. Uh, that I believe would satisfy the Saudis uh, and the Emiratis, uh, Bahrainis and Egyptians, and I think are also reasonable. No one could claim that these are really unreasonable kinds of conditions. Uh, and the, the four are uh, that, that first, uh, the, the countries should fully implement the MOU on countering terrorist financing, which was concluded by them with Secretary Tillerson. Second, uh, that anyone who has been designated by the United States to be on the terrorism list or to be seen as a facilitator, a supporter of terror, should either be arrested by the Qataris if they're in Qatar or expelled by them. Um, third, any group in the region that we see is contributing to instability, the Qataris will no longer finance. And fourth, uh, that the Qataris would stop their subsidies. They'd phase out their subsidies for Al Jazeera. Uh, Al Jazeera is many things, but I think one of the things that it has done, it has created a platform that legitimizes the views of those who embody the radical Islamist ideologies. Uh, I've said it to you before, you watch oftentimes someone who represents those kinds of extremist attitudes, and they're put on with someone who might have mainstream attitudes, and they're equal. They're treated as if they're the equivalent, which means you legitimize a point of view that should not be legitimized. So these are the kind of conditions, I think, that uh, should, would, would meet our needs on the one hand, should be acceptable to the Saudis, uh, Emiratis, and others, and Qatar should be prepared to accept that. So first, I'd like to get your reaction sure. to that. Well, this is a demonstration of why he's one of the most respected diplomats of his time, and uh, particularly out in that region. Um, second, let me just note that, look, I had issues with the Qataris. You know, on the one hand, as commander of the U.S. Central Command, um, they provided $100 million for the, just the headquarters uh, of, of Central right. Command forward. Uh, we added another $100 million in IT and all kinds of other uh, systems to that. So this is an extraordinary platform that we had. That's on top of the Combined Air Operations Center we have out there that's been operating the air wars over Iraq, Afghanistan, now Syria, Yemen, and various other places. Uh, the airfield complex, which is so vast that, as you know, you could run out of gas just taxiing around the thing right. on, on certain days. Uh, so it's really quite extraordinary. And then, on the other hand, and I went to the then Prime Minister, and to my very, very good friend, General Hamid, now then Minister Hamid, and now Special Advisor Hamid, um, I'm convinced he in particular was an extraordinary good friend of the United States, but I'd say, so you've done this on the one hand, uh, and then on the other, you're allowing and even subsidizing uh, a TV channel uh, that is being used in part uh, as a platform by right. extremists or very nefarious political Islamists. Uh, not the Anada type in Tunisia, which is willing to, right. to be, look to the good of the country rather than to their party, uh, and is quite exemplary in that regard. So uh, we had those issues. I do think we have to be careful not to overdo it. 
Uh, we need to remember that the reason the Taliban are in Doha is because we asked them to be there. Mm -hmm. Richard Holbrook, I think rightly said, we've got to have a place where they can be so that we can engage them. Uh, this is all done in coordination with the United States. The reception for them, the security and everything else, I think, met all of our standards. And the same with one or more of the Hamas leaders uh, uh, who, again, are there because Israel and the U.S. asked them to be there. It's not to say all the others and all the rest of this. That's more but the it, exception than the rule, I have it's, to say. Yeah. And, and, but we've got to be careful not to undermine the arguments mm -hmm. or the, the points, if you will, by those that are, are, are uh, not accurate, because there's enough, I think, um, uh, otherwise. Um, I think the points you made are very reasonable. Uh, I th and I do think, for what it's worth, having, you know, you and I both, I think, right. maybe more than others, are the recipients of lots of communication from either side in this discussion and have been able to ferret out for ourselves, I think, what is right. fact and what is, is not, not quite so factual. Um, and uh, look, I think they're quite intent at this point in living on the, by that MOU. And I wish the United States would declassify it. They have told me, uh, very senior, as senior as you can get, that they, would, they believe it should be declassified and they'd like to see the MOU made public. And they have been briefing members of Congress. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that we will allow that to take place so that everyone can see it. Um, and then the other uh, items that you have, I think, are, again, uh, very solid, very sound, and very reasonable. I think they're so reasonable, probably all the countries uh, in that region ought to subscribe to the same principles. Uh, because as you know, there are issues with some of the other countries right. there. Not about countries supporting extremist groups, but about individuals high net worth individuals. Yes. I mean, we dealt with this a lot when I was Central Command and, and CIA as well. So again, I think that's a great approach. I think it's, it's, it's both substantively uh, more than adequate, it meets, uh, and it's reasonable. It meets, meets the I think, the intent right. and addresses the legitimate concerns uh, of the countries. And you're absolutely right. Look, we've got to get this past us. We've got to, we got to, they need to come back together. We can't have a splintering of the GCC. Uh, and you can't push one or other countries in this direction or that direction. Uh, and I hope that, that, that this kind of thinking and spirit and so forth can be manifested in action. I really do think if this was the American position that was presented to both sides and said, this is the way we're going to resolve this, this stresses everybody's legitimate concerns and meets what is something that we really feel has to be dealt with? Yep. That and uh, a few phone calls uh, from the right person. A few phone calls from the right person and with an understanding that these are the conditions that actually we're not going to negotiate because they represent what are a set of things that relate to what is actually threatening us yeah. and them. And I think that is reasonable. Um, and then we see where we go from there. Right. Well, we're at, I, I, I've been told I have one minute. Uh, a diplomatic summing and, up yeah, is so in order. And, and what happens after one minute is there's a trap door here. <laughs> the two of us disappear. Um, let me just sort of conclude, I guess, by, by saying when you, I, I realize one minute means one minute for both of us, so <laughs> I've already taken up 30 and seconds. It can be an exception. Right. <laughs> uh, when you look at what's going on in Kirkuk right now, yes. how concerned are you? I'm quite concerned, uh, again, because different elements are exploiting this for their uh, own purposes, because it is causing a, a bit of a break between the Kurdish uh, regional government partners, uh, between the PUK and the KDP in particular, mm -hmm. um, because it could go farther. And I'm, again, hopeful that this is, is halted. Again, I. Um, what you, um, you hope it is. And, you know, talk to Brett McGurk, the president's yeah. envoy, uh, Doug Silliman, the ambassador. I think those are two, two superb individuals are in a tough place because these are all our friends. Not all, right. but the Kurds are our friends and the Iraqis, Prime Minister Abadi, these are our friends. We want inclusive governance uh, to succeed uh, in Iraq, but there are elements up there and engaged in this, as we mentioned earlier, that are not fans of inclusive governance and that want to Lebanonize Iraq right. just like they'd like to Lebanonize Syria. In other words, to use uh, militias, essentially, controlled by Iran, by the Quds Force, uh, in those countries in the same way that they've used Hezbollah in Lebanon 
so that it doesn't just have a paramilitary aspect to it, but it has a political aspect. In the case of Lebanon, obviously, it literally has a veto-proof right. uh, uh, element in the parliament if they can keep that together. So that is my concern. Yes. So the trapdoor is not opening up. Uh, I want to thank Dave Petraeus, uh, I thank first of all, for his, Ross. his service, uh, but also what is really his strategic, strategic perspective on the region. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you all.